The five errors theory is one of the theories that I use to try to formulate and visualize how the lands could have looked in the past. We have no idea what the actual history is. Yes, we're given a historical account, but we have many inconsistencies in it and we see many contradictions. The portion of the five errors theory that I bring up here though, is dividing it up into looking at to how our civilization came to where it is. We start with the golden age. And the Golden Age consists of the first three eras. Now, there are many cultures that have a division of five eras that are across the land. And this is the reason why I picked five eras. I don't know. There could be many more. There could be many less. Many things were possible in the Golden Age. Human beings were much more advanced and much more developed spiritually. And they could achieve great architectural achievements. I also believe that in the third era is where the Star Fort Builders came from. We're now in our contemporary age or what others might call the Iron Age, or we jokingly refer to as the Plastic Age. And we call it that because everything is very disposable. And it seems as though we can feel internally that this era that we live in now does not match what was in the past. Although we'll be ridiculed for this, even though there's a lot of evidence that suggests otherwise. Today we're going to be looking at the Tartarian Age, or the Fourth Era. Now I call this the Tartarian Age, and there are many alternative researchers that are saying we shouldn't be using this term all the time. It's just a name that's associated with it, a worldwide civilization that existed before our own. But what did it really look like? Well, we have to go back and revisualize the other eras. The first era, the Golden Age, where pretty much anything was possible, where human beings lived exceptionally long lifetimes, and they had an infinite spiritual health. They understood themselves, they understood their environment, and they existed in a wonderful balance with it. Not the promises of balances, but true balances. And their architectural achievements were stunning. They could build buildings that reached to the very clouds, and who knows, perhaps the very nature of the land is very different than we can imagine. It's not just buildings, it could have been vast flora and fauna that existed. And there's a reason why they try to tie this in with explanations of things existing many millions of years ago. But who knows what the actual timeline is? Was this first era of the Golden Age 10,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, or 5,000 years ago? We don't really have any way to know. And the only remnants we see of this are in great rocks and in certain areas of the land where we have hints of once great buildings that existed in the very distant past. Or maybe it wasn't such a distant past after all because the forces that destroyed these buildings and leveled the land are things that we cannot understand but we can certainly speculate on them. The whole point behind the first era of the Golden Age is to understand that in the very beginning, we believe that human beings were exceptionally developed. Now this theory could be completely wrong, but the evidence that backs it up is whenever you go across the land and you find evidence of melted buildings, vast structures that once covered the land. And on this channel, we explored the Castle Rock ruins in Wisconsin, and we saw that there were hints of vast structures that once existed there that had to be larger than we could possibly imagine. We also see structures such as Devil's Tower. It may have once been a large tree, or it may have once been a large structure, or something else. In the second era, we postulate a civilization that existed, rising from the ashes of the first era. Now, others may call this the Silver Age, and we'll review what this really was when we look at the Greek theory of the Five Ages. However, the second era, this is where we suspect the pyramid builders really came from. And we think of the original pyramids, or the Great Pyramids on the Giza Plateau. They were simply smaller satellite pyramids. We have evidence of much larger pyramids that are built across the land. And in my theories on this channel, I believe that this came from a second era, or a civilization that was still in a golden age, but in a different portion of a golden age. They constructed pyramids because it was a geometrically sound structure, and it also showed their connection to the land. And we don't fully understand what kind of technology that was available both in the construction of these pyramids, and then how they factored into the overall society and the use of such technology. But we suspect that these buildings also developed the internal human being. They supported the spiritual health of the person, and not just provided a structure for societal use. It's a very interesting balance to think of. A building that serves society, but at the same time serves the individual. It seems as though our modern buildings oftentimes deprive us of our spiritual health, and they're very, how shall we say, <laughs> not even remotely aesthetically pleasing. They're just there to be there and serve a function. The third era, which is another era in the last era of the Golden Age, that followed 
the Pyramid Builders. And this was an era where we believe that the civilization advanced to building the great star forts, where they could manipulate the land and the structures and integrate them accordingly. No one really knows what heights the civilization reached, but we can speculate that they had tremendous capabilities to build towers to the very sky. They also had the ability to form and shape the land in geometrical configurations that endure to this day. We can see the remnants of this civilization everywhere we look across the lands. There are star forts everywhere. There are also star forts that are integrated in the very land. We also have the theories about how the land is shaped in many places, where we see large shan bars that extend for many miles on the coasts in many lands across the realm. Now we look at our current era, the fifth era, the plastic age, and we see that none of what it is really compares to what we had in the past. We have tall towers of glass and steel, yet they give the impression of being very cheap and disposable. They also show us the fact that our civilization just seems to be something that's readily thrown away and can be thrown away. We also have to remember that we have many, many images of destruction from films, television shows. But today we're going to look specifically at the fourth era, the Tartarian civilization or the civilization that preceded ours. We want to get an idea of what heights they reached. What was the maximum extent of their capabilities? Because this is the civilization that we see the most defined and detailed remnants of, such as the Iowa State Capitol, the many other beautiful state capitol buildings, the Art Deco buildings, all these buildings that we look at and all these city explorations that we do, they reflect the remnants of the Fourth Era. Now, let's look at the Tartarian Fourth Era civilization. And remember, Tartaria is just a term that I assigned to it. The civilization could have been called something completely different. Here's a possible timeline. Break it down into three eras, if you will, or three portions, three phases. An inception and a rising phase, an ascendancy in the height of their civilization, and then a decline and a fall. How long were each of these phases of this Tartarian civilization? We just don't know. They could be a thousand years. They could be a hundred years. We seem to have a great obsession with a thousand years, and it's probably because it's a nice round number. What did this really look like, though? The main component of this theory is we have to consider the society that existed in this worldwide civilization, their culture, their values, their capabilities, and then ultimately their vulnerabilities. How was it they fell? When they rose, it was clear that they had remnants of the previous era, the third era. But we suspect that the third era endured a great reset or some sort of cataclysm. Looking at what this civilization looked like during its height, we have to think on the integration potentially of pyramid buildings, great towers and domes that reach to the very sky. They had energy capabilities and the ability to generate imagery or energy, both from the atmosphere and then we've also speculated that they had some sort of crystal power source. They may have had many other sources of energy that they were able to draw from because it's energy that allowed them to build a great society and civilization. Yet at the same time, we speculate that they had a balance. A balance that they achieved between the society and the individual. Harvesting this energy may have well reflected that balance in the fact that they were able to understand the energy that they could harvest from both the land and the very air and the atmosphere. And at the same time, the energy that existed beneath the land. It seems as though this gave them the capability, along with their developed cultural and societal understanding, to achieve great constructions beyond our wildest dreams. We only see the bare bones remnants of many of these wonderful structures. Think on the fact that we have diagrams and sketches that show us these incredible buildings at their very height. Yet we take this to even what many would consider a science fiction imaging or imagery of what the society may have looked like at their very height. They had airships, they had vast tall buildings across the land. They had cities that stretched for many, many miles, much larger than the cities that we see today. And their structures were built to be enduring, to last. And of course you'll ask, well exactly how did such a large signature of such a civilization fall? Why is it not with us? We don't understand the capabilities that were used to destroy it. We suspect that there was some sort of force or threat that arose in the land that either defeated the civilization internally or externally. A lot of the hints that we have, though, indicate that it was defeated internally. Initially in the conflict, the civilization won in an external conflict. Now, what do we mean by an internal conflict? This adversary found some sort of way to infiltrate the very beings of people and turn them against the civilization. 
We look at the great beauty at the very height, imagining a civilization that was in total balance. And it's not just the balance between society and the individual, it's also the understanding of the many cultural groups that no doubt existed in the civilization. They were able to exist in a harmonious nature. And we might reflect on the fact that it seems as though everything in our current civilization operates to turn us against each other through any visual difference or any sort of difference, be it a perceived economic, political, or whatever, to keep us at each other's throats. We look at some of the other possibilities of the previous civilization. Great airships with no limits in their traveling capacity. Great airships that could travel the land very quickly and efficiently. There's been a lot of speculation about airplanes recently, and perhaps the reality behind airplanes and jets is that they use some remnant of this technology, and that's why they appear to take off and land so slowly, almost as though they're hovering in a way and they don't operate in the manner that we're told. Yet we look at these great images of these airships and their vast hangars, and again, we still see the remnants of this technology scattered across the land. This is what will be shown airship hangars looked like in the 1920s. The fact being, though, is that this did really exist. It causes us to question if the capacity behind this, though, is far greater than we're shown. That this is merely the bare bones remnants of it. The only portions of the technology that they could return to operational capacity. It's interesting to me that we even have accounts that question the existence and the veracity of these airships docking with tall buildings and tall structures. Some cities, such as Tulsa, even completely deny the account that an airship ever docked with any tall structure in the city. Yet there are other accounts within the history of aviation that shows that this is very true, and this was far more commonplace than they'd like us to think now. We consider the fact that there's been a very defined attack on airships. Now we visualize the decline of this previous civilization. If we suspect that they won a physical external war against some unknown enemy, we have to realize that the unknown enemy changed its tactics and infiltrated the civilization itself by corrupting human beings from the inside. As a result, they began to corrupt the very facets that kept the civilization propped up, considering the fact that the civilization was based on an effective government that actually worked in the interests of the people. That was probably one of the first things that changed. The government then became self-serving or serving the purposes and intentions of the exterior force that infiltrated it. Therefore, they began to turn the civilization against one another, emphasizing every single physical, social, and economic difference, whether they were real or not. Even the perceived differences, the ideals, caused these people to begin to distrust one another, and gradually their civilization began to erode from the inside out. The great buildings were no longer maintained, the energy systems were neglected, People began to even question their once great purpose in life and achieving the very pinnacle of human being. They began to turn away from that. And you can find evidence in that in every single account from every civilization and culture that exists on the land today, that people were corrupted. Eventually, it became a point to where the civilization could no longer defend itself from an external threat. And either using some natural cataclysm or perhaps an unnatural cataclysm, an artificial attack using weapons beyond our greatest imagination. They were able to destroy and wreck many of the greatest structures of the civilization that preceded ours. And we have numerous stories of destruction of great edifices in the past, wondrous cities that were reduced to nothing, melted to ash and rubble, and we really don't see any remnants of it today. We think that perhaps the great fires that we read about that seem to dot every single city in the 19th century may have been the finalized destruction of the great structures that remained. We also consider the fact that we have many tales from both biblical and mainstream accounts of vast destruction in the past, even as recently as the 20th century, considering the Tunguska event in Siberia and even the destruction of the Bronx, which occurred supposedly as late as the 1970s and the early 1980s. Yet the concept of fire from the sky is something that we have to take a lot more seriously. There had to be some great force that was employed, and that's how many of the greatest, in structure, greatest structures that once existed were utterly annihilated. And here's an image of what remains of the Castle Rock ruins, as I called it, in Wisconsin. Yet you can see it's the remnants of once great buildings. Now I suspect that this is from an earlier era, but this could be as recently as the last era, the fourth era, or the Tartarian civilization. 
We just don't know. So we have to operate on speculation and try to put the pieces together to put together the overall story of what really happened. And why do I suspect that these ruins are much older and are actually the ruins of these great buildings? Well, it's because of the fact that you can't really get an idea of the structures, but you still see signs of symmetry in these ruins. And these signs of symmetry and the vast magnitude that they reflected had to be the once great structures of the first era. The structures that reached the very clouds, the legends that we have of such edifices as the Tower of Babel. Yet there are many other accounts that indicate that there were once very large structures that existed, again through societies and cultures across the land, and will be told it was merely the work of the gods. This is a idealized depiction of the Golden Age from the Greek account of the Golden Age. And they have a different breakdown of the five eras, or the five portions of civilization. The Golden Age, the human beings lived amongst the gods, they lived for hundreds of years, and their spirits endured even after they died. They never grew old. Now, is that a reality, or is that just something that we're told to convince us to believe in it? It's ultimately up for you to decide. Of course, now we'll be told that a Golden Age can be reached again with our technology, and we've always been promised this great future. Although, as time passes, we see that no great future is ever delivered to us. We can see that our society continues to grow more disposable. It continues to be something that just feels as though that the quality of service and the quality of life is decreasing. Of course, you'll be told that you're wrong and the quality of life is increasing. However, anybody who has any self-awareness and is capable of thinking for themselves can see that the quality of life is declining. It's not the Garden of Eden. It's not this idealized existence. That just seems to be a false promise that we're given in our current state of being. Did it exist in the past? Well, it must have because we have accounts of it. And we are constantly detracted or deterred from even trying to visualize this. And we are not encouraged to think that this existed in the past. As though someone doesn't want us to even be able to visualize how great society can be. We have numerous depictions and allusions to things such as a fountain of youth. And why is that so alluring to us? Why is it we fear aging and death so much? Even in the golden age, death was a part of life. Apparently aging was not, according to the accounts that we have. Now whether they're true or not is irrelevant. We still have this perception that the fear of life comes from the ultimate fear of death and the fear of aging. And you can see many examples of how both these fears are used time and time again. We also have accounts of great civilizations that may or may not have existed, such as the legendary kingdom of Prester John. We're told that this was merely a myth that motivated European explorers to go across the land and try to attempt to locate what they believed was an ally to Christendom in the distant past. Yet looking at some of the accounts of Prester John, it almost feels as though we're given accounts of a remnant or an enclave, an organized enclave of the Tartarian civilization or the fourth era that somehow survived the reset and continued to exist and may have existed much closer to the contemporary era than we like to think. Naturally, it was targeted and destroyed over time. And perhaps these are what the great campaigns or the massive reset war that we speculated occurred in the 19th century may have been all about destroying. These enclaves that existed across the land and perhaps the enclave of Prester John or whatever the real name was of the individual or society that existed there. Yet looking around, we still see many of the bare bones remnants of the previous civilization. And it's everywhere, such as here in New Orleans where you'll see a lot of accounts and a lot of images that show that great advanced buildings ex existed there. Defenders of the mainstream account will tell us, well, it was simply part of the great French presence that existed in North America and that they forfeited it when they sold it as part of the Louisiana Purchase because of the Napoleonic Wars, which are a very questionable event in and of themselves. Yet we see many of these buildings, and while they may be smaller in scale, we suspect that these buildings are the remnants of the previous civilization, that they reflected their greatness. Now, this is a building that supposedly preceded the Art Deco era in Cleveland, and yet we see such beauty and amazing architectural achievement with it, with the pediment and the columns, and even the height and the beauty and the artistic desire of it. Perhaps this was just a small administrative building that existed in the previous civilization. Or the Marble Room, going back to Cleveland, a beautiful, amazing place to dine, which, again, displays the connection between a society and an individual. 
a place where you can go and interact with other individuals and at the same time feel your internal being being strengthened just by being present in this room. And during the exploration of this particular room, I joked that even a McDonald's hamburger would taste like fine dining if you had this kind of atmosphere and environment that you're eating it in. We also see the remaining state capitals, and we have no doubt that these are clearly the remaining buildings of the previous civilization. Perhaps they were low-level administration buildings, or they were regional administration buildings that survived whatever targeted effects of the last reset occurred whether that was some sort of artificial weapon, a directed energy weapon, or some other power means that we don't understand. Perhaps the very technology of the previous civilization was subverted and used against it, which we speculated with cymatics. We see images of the current age, also called the Iron Age, or what we call the Plastic Age, which states that people are born with gray hair, that people age rapidly, and they live a very harsh lifestyle, and that the only people who aspire to greatness are the people who are the most proficient at lying. And we see a lot of truth in this. We see a lot of truth in this in our contemporary society and also in the accounts that we have of the past where a society or a civilization is subverted by its own ruthless desires. We also think of all the images that we have of utterly destroyed cities, which again reinforces the notion that the previous civilization was completely annihilated, that many of their great buildings were destroyed and only certain buildings managed to survive this reset. Of course, this is from St. Louis, and we have a mainstream account that's utterly silly in my mind that a steamboat or a paddle steamer started this fire because it crashed into other boats on the river, and then it crashed into buildings somehow and started a great conflagration. We also have the Chicago Fire, and we see immense images of apocalyptic destruction from the Chicago Fire. Somehow the city was quickly built in a short period of time, the Chicago Fire occurred in the 1870s, and then they quickly rebuilt it, to the point to where they were ready to have the greatest World's Fair of all time in the 1890s. Now, if you want to believe this mainstream account, that's entirely up to you, and maybe you think this is credible. Maybe you think these kind of amazing feats and logistics are possible because people worked hard, and if they didn't work hard, they starved and they died. Yet, I find this account very hard to believe, and I find it much more likely that these are images of the last phases of destruction of the previous civilization, where they were targeting any buildings that would be too difficult to explain, or buildings that they could not convincingly repurpose and put in a presupposed narrative. Now, yes, we say narrative, and that term gets a lot of der derisive attitude towards it, and rightfully so. However, it is a narrative. It is an account that we're supposed to believe. And the whole point behind it is to cause us to not have any understanding of our true history. Because if we don't know our true history, then we don't know our true identity. Our identity can, can be shaped to whatever power that truly rules the land wants our identity to be. We're simply nothing. We're creatures who have no greater spiritual health or existence. And we exist for their very pleasure, to be used and discarded as soon as we're done. And they'll openly admit this, too, in mainstream accounts. Yet we look back to the Golden Age, and we realize that there was something much greater. There are accounts that our civilization and our people and our identity was much greater in the distant past. That's the real purpose behind these explorations. It's a journey inward to rediscover the strength that lies within, that lies within every human being. That's why my approach is not to tell you what to think. You have to decide for yourself what to think. You have to decide for yourself what to believe, who to listen to, and what's really true and real and what's not. And I'm not ever going to insult anyone by insulting what they believe. And if you believe the mainstream account is correct, well then go ahead. It's not going to bother me whatsoever. However, going back to the previous age, there's no doubt that it seemed to be a return to the glories of the distant past. At its very height, the Tartarian Age did reach that, with a balance between society and the individual, with a true cultural understanding. Perhaps the story of the Tower of Babel is not so distant or legendary as we like to think. Perhaps it's not reflecting the differences in languages, but simply reflecting the differences in civilizations and cultures, as they've now been inherently divided and are encouraged to be, or encouraged to be divided, by the current ruling powers of the lands. Because it's a lot easier to retain control when you keep people divided. You keep them unaware of what their past is. They live in a state of amnesia, or much worse, they live with a fabricated past. And that's the question people always ask. Why would anybody go to the trouble of doing this? Because you can achieve total control. 
Now, we haven't really explored who the enemy is, or who really caused all this, the previous fall of civilization and humanity. We're going to explore that in an upcoming video on this channel called The Ancient Enemy. There's going to be some theories involved, but there is a lot of evidence, and that evidence is found in the current actions that we witness every day in the land, for how people are divided, how people may be subverted from within, and what's the true nature of the external threat. Remember that these buildings still exist. They are everywhere. And this is hard evidence that a previous civilization existed. You can go to the Iowa State Capitol, you can touch the internal walls and the external walls, and you can see that this is all true material. It is real and it is still with us everywhere. That's important to remember as we continue our exploration. Welcome to the Restituto Orbis channel. Through our explorations in the last several months on this channel, we've seen incredible buildings across the land. Buildings that defy simple explanation and inspire our imagination. We've looked into the origin of these buildings and we've explored many details about them. We've also looked at the conflicts that have given rise to our land and the current age that we live in. And yet these buildings continue to persist. A reminder of a long forgotten glory. We see incredible achievements that we know we could never match today. Although we're assured that several of our architects and our capabilities could do it with simple financial resources, yet these buildings tell a very different story. The fact that they were all constructed during the same time frame in the United States defies the original given account that we have about them being built over the past 1,000 years. But what's the real story that we have? On this channel, we have the Five Eras Theory, where we consider the true account of humanity. That there were five eras of human existence, five civilizations. Today, we're going to be starting the story of looking at Tartaria, or the Fourth Era Civilization, the civilization that preceded ours. On this channel, we assign the name Tartaria to refer to it, but we don't know what the actual name of this civilization was. In the video Pax Tartaria, we looked at what Tartaria could really look like. And now we're going to look to tell the story of Tartaria. How can we tell a story about events that we have no knowledge of? I believe that we have many clues and indications in our given account that tell us exactly what happened and give us many clues for what transpired in the previous civilization, how it rose, how it reached its ascendancy, and how it fell. We look at the first era, the Golden Age, and while we have no direct reflections of the Golden Age, we know it happened. We do have accounts in many of our myth about the incredible edifices, towers that were built to reach the heavens, structures that we can't even begin to imagine to this day. The remnants do still exist. We can still see the bare bones evidence that these structures did once inhabit the land. But what do they look like? And what accounts do we have of these structures? Consider the Tower of Babel. Consider the account that in many different cultures, there are mythical stories that allude to towers that reach the heavens. Perhaps in this image, we see the remains of such a tower that reached to the heavens. Many people will consider it an absurd possibility that this image you're looking at is the remnants of a foundation of such an incredible tower. Yet it's entirely possible because if it's such an absurd notion, then why does it always have to be attacked and discredited? Why does it seem like people don't even want you to ask questions or have alternate considerations about things? Why is it such a threat if these are hard, objective facts? There's always such an intense emotional response to what people consider fact, and yet their devotion to fact becomes dogmatic. We consider the second era, the next civilization that followed the first civilization, in the golden era of humanity, which was the first three eras. The second era we saw pyramid builders, and we speculate that this was the civilization that achieved its ascendancy in building pyramids. And we see remnants of these pyramids all over the land, even the Great Pyramid in Bosnia, which of course will be told is merely a natural structure. And once again, there has to be a lot of devotion to discrediting it as a natural structure. The third era, where we posit are the star fort builders, another great civilization that managed to manipulate the geometry of the land while maintaining a delicate balance with nature. They built the great star forts with incredible towers. Perhaps a legend of the Tower of Babel came from this era. 
or maybe it was from an earlier era. Despite the fact that we have myths that overlap, and we have accounts that seem somewhat conflicted, there are consistencies that we can find. If you examine the myth, and if you look at your own intuition, you can find that the civilization that preceded ours, the fourth era, the era that we call Tartaria, ascended to great wonders in their architectural capability, while at the same time they also reflected the same traits that we saw in the earlier civilization, achieving a wondrous balance between the individual and society and between the artificial constructs of society and nature. While once again this notion will be ridiculed, why does it have to be ridiculed? Isn't that what we're looking for? And yet we look at our own contemporary era, the fifth era, the plastic age, the iron age, the age where it seems as though people have descended to simply settling for what they're told is the best that they can have. People who no longer look inward, people who no longer face their internal struggles, but simply look for others to solve their problems and issues for them, and simply look to blame others for every single challenge that they have in life. They don't seek to work together, and they don't seek to achieve a balance, both internally and with their society. They simply operate in terms of currency, and oftentimes this currency is merely an ideal. When we look at the five eras theory and the possible timelines, we have the Golden Age with the first three eras that we saw depictions of, we have the Tartarian Age, or the fourth era, and then we have our contemporary age. In these series of explorations that the channel will be embarking on in the next several weeks, we're going to specifically examine the civilization that preceded ours, the fourth era of the Tartarian Age. We're going to examine how it rose, which is the topic of this video. We're going to look at its ascendancy, and then we're also going to consider how it fell and how it led us to come to the contemporary age. And while many of these aspects are based on theory, there is a lot of evidence that supports a lot of these conclusions. Now, where does this evidence come from? I believe that there are truths that are embedded in our given history and also within our myth. Because when you step back far enough and you look at the whole picture, you can find the way that the pieces fit together. The way that they fit together that tell the actual account of the true history of humanity. Now, of course, the powers that be enjoy the fact that we are confused and that we only have bits of information that are conflicted and mixed and scattered. And yet we see that at the end of the third era, we had achieved the great construction of star forts. And there is evidence of these star forts that continue to this day, not small military posts that were merely enclaves to position cannons, but large shitties. Once the society collapsed and the civilization was destroyed in a hard reset, it gave birth to the fourth era, the Tartarian civilization. We'll be looking at that specifically, and we're going to consider exactly how it began and how the roots of its beginning were actually found in the remnants of the civilization of the third era. Looking at images of the third era, we have things that defy our imagination. Incredible structures, an incredible civilization that spanned the entire world. It was unified in purpose, and yet at the same time it had achieved a fine balance in its existence and in the conduct of its society. We will always be told that such a consideration for a civilization being unified in purpose is absurd. It's a notion that seems alien to us because we think of our own contemporary civilization where we have divided nations and we have divisions inflicted on the human species in every way imaginable. Whether it's what we think, it's how we believe, or how we live. And these divisions are reinforced in every day and every news broadcast that we have. Yet imagine such a beautiful civilization where people could exist in balance. Some people may consider this a terrifying notion, that these people were able to live in close quarters and yet at the same time be prosperous. Yet we have every indication that they could, at least until the hard reset at the end of the third era occurred. We're not exactly certain what happened, but we refer to this event either as a flame deluge or fire from the sky that completely destroyed the civilization. We have a lot of evidence of melted structures across the land. And if you go to locations such as Cappadocia, Turkey, you will see where this has transpired. The result being that the civilization of the third era was completely destroyed. The star fort builders had their structures eradicated by the fire. The foundations remain, and we still have many 
remnants of the cities and the patterns on which they were built. The remnants of the destruction by fire. Yet we question what occurred with the civilization. Were there remnants of it that managed to break off into pockets of survival that persisted through this flame deluge? There seems to be a lot of evidence that there were remnants. Were they smaller civilizations themselves? Isolated settlements? Or perhaps even the real indications that we have with the isolated monasteries that were told in our own official account that survived and managed to thrive off the grid while preserving the knowledge of the previous civilization. Consider a science fiction story called A Canticle for Leibowitz, a story that gives us the concept of the psychic existence of humanity, where we constantly see the civilization destroyed by different aspects available to it. Now granted, this is a civilization that destroyed itself. Yet when we look at the rise of Tartaria, we're looking at a civilization that rose from the ashes of a previous civilization. It suffice to say that the fourth era rose from the remnants of the third era. But it seems that this was so effective because vast quantities of knowledge were preserved from the third era. And as a result, the civilization that rose that became Tartaria had access to this. What efforts had actually preserved this knowledge? Well, based on what we have in our own official historical account, we know that there were isolated pockets or survivors who had preserved knowledge of the previous civilization. And it wasn't simply the knowledge of the building processes, the existence of the society, and the technologies that they used to flourish. It was also simply the awareness of the society. Because the true fundamental belief of people in themselves comes from their understanding of what civilization they had, how they fit within it, but then also an awareness of the individual. That is the fine balance that we had in the past. So even though there were great terrifying ruins from the hard reset of the end of the third era of the Starfort Builders civilization, we can see that there were the foundations in its destruction that would lead to the rise of another great civilization in the fourth era. The civilization that we refer to as Tartaria. Now is this name appropriate? Perhaps not. Perhaps there is a much more encompassing name that would be more fitting. But consider the order that preserved civilization, the survivors of the third era, those that still had the knowledge of how that society functioned, the basic knowledges of the sciences that they had achieved that were preserved, the technological level. It must have been a difficult struggle, and they endured on isolated outposts and compounds, many of the remnants that we still see today, compounds that had to survive, roving bands of survivors, and other great challenges, lack of supplies, lack of access to water and food, the simple struggle for survival had to consume their daily lives. Yet despite the struggle for survival, they preserved knowledge. And they managed to do so in a way that allowed the future civilization of Tartaria to rise. Having access to the knowledge and awareness of the previous civilizations. Think on how fundamentally powerful that would be to have access to previous civilizations. To simply be aware of what the true account of events that preceded you really were. Because all you have to do is compare the account that we're given and you can find vast inconsistencies. Even in the accounts that were given of very recent events that only occurred even in the last few years and a few decades ago. You don't have to go very far back in our given historical account to find vast inconsistencies. Whether it's in what we're actually told or the images that we have or both. When you look at it in totality, you see that there are so many inconsistencies that you simply have to be someone who accepts what they're told without question to accept the given historical narrative that we have. And while that term is often derided, that's exactly what it is. Now does that mean that we're seeking to replace it with another historical narrative? We are seeking to find the truth. The truth of what our actual history is, although history is often a misnomer in and of itself. We are looking to understand who we are, what we're about, and what our past truly was. 
because it's knowledge of the past that enabled the previous civilization to rise to such great heights. Once again, many people will deride those who seek to live a greater life or seek to have more. And yet, no doubt, there were many survivors from the collapse of the Third Era who wandered the land and thought about having a greater life. Having a greater life where they could achieve balance. A balance with nature and a balance of the individual with the society. They struggled through many great difficulties and hardships, living in the ruins of what remained of their civilization. While at the same time, many retained both the knowledge and the spirit that had made the Third Era the civilization of dreams to us. It seems as though the concept of division is something that's fundamentally induced within our society now. Every day we're reminded and reinforced of how and why we should be divided and why the cause of all of our daily problems is some other random group of people for whatever reason. And oftentimes we'll be given very flimsy accounts of evidence for this. Yet in the past it seems as though once the fourth era started, people began to look within themselves and they saw the flaws that they had. They understood and appreciated the flaws that they had as individuals. We all have flaws. I have flaws. You have flaws. And if you're viewing this video, you are someone who seeks to improve their own life. But not just their own life, but to dream and conceptualize a civilization to where we could actually live in balance with one another and live in balance with nature. That's frequently the offer that we have from our current civilization. And yet oftentimes we see that we never come close to making any progress towards that. Imagine a civilization in balance between the nature and the individual. This is what rose with Tartaria in the fourth era. They were able to rebuild many of the lost structures. And while they may not have replicated the advances and achievements of the past, they did achieve stunning advancements in a different sort of architecture. And you can see this in how the structures that they built remain to this day. We know that they're different than the Starfort builders of the Third Era, and yet they built on top of the foundations. And in many places, we still see the remnants and the signs of the great Starfort cities. Their beautiful, intricate layouts, suggesting a technology and an integration with nature that exceeds our wildest imagination to this day. But the evidence is still there. Their appearances dot the landscape. These are not simply small military forts or bastions from some conflict that occurred two to three hundred years ago. These are entire cities that are laid out on these elaborate and intricate star fort structures that show a knowledge of geometry that surpasses the application within an integration of nature that we can't begin to imagine. But it was possible. And you don't just see it in cities, you also see it in vast aspects of the landscape. And that is exactly what Tartaria had and understood that they were able to build on top of. They were able to integrate a lot of the aspects and achievements of their civilization, their structures, on top of the previous civilization. It was a fundamental figurative and literal presentation of how far Tartaria was able to go. Ironically, there is a parallel within our given historical account, and that's of the rise of Rome and Greece. We're told that from this period that we're told is antiquity, that these two civilizations, which were separate yet somehow amalgamated, managed to achieve great and stunning architecture, and that they're the ones to be credited with the remnants of all the columns, the pillars, the pediments, and all the beautiful architecture that we see. And we'll ask how was it done and we'll be told that despite the fact that their civil society was fundamentally corrupt and flawed, that they practiced slavery, it was simply due to their hard, darkened will that they managed to drive individuals in slavery to build these incredible edifices. Yet these edifices are across the land. And we're told finally that after a period of dark ages or a medieval period, our civilization, the one that we believe in, that we're given in our historical account, came from a renaissance. Yet we see so many fundamental conflicts in the actual society and the values. 
Consider the story of Gawain and the Green Knight, one of the fundamental Arthurian legends. This is a story that's long been with us, and the theme is quite simple. That an individual who aspires to be a perfect human being and live by a perfect set of rules finds that they cannot be perfect. The most definitive evidence of this is in the Green Sash, where Gawain, the knight, who embarks upon the quest after he encounters the Green Knight, the Green Knight who shows up and offers any knight in Arthur's court the chance to swing at his head with an axe, which Gawain takes up the challenge, knocks off the Green Knight's head, which the Green Knight simply picks up and puts back on. A year later, Gawain has to receive a return blow. He's taken in by the house of a noble, and at that noble's house, he is given numerous gifts which he has to share with the noble, to include the affections of the nobleman's wife. Gawain is honest and true, and shares everything with the nobleman whose house he stays at. However, because Gawain loves life, he realizes that he's not a perfect man, as he does not tell his noble the gift that his wife gave him of the green sash. His wife telling him that the green sash would protect him and preserve his life when he received the return blow at the hands of the green knight. The real theme behind the story, though, is that we are not perfect. Yet the Arthurian legend shows an ideal versus a reality. We're told that during the Dark Ages, during the medieval times of our own civilization that we believe in, most of us do with our given historical account, that oftentimes it was simply an ideal, that there was really no such thing as chivalry, that there was no such thing as honor, and there was certainly no such thing as decency between human beings. People would murder each other, people would go off on vast crusades, jihads, or whatever holy war term that they had at the time, and commit acts of genocide, all in the name of furthering their own civilization and their own belief. Yet is this really the account that occurred, or is this just simply what we're told? We have to consider the fact that what we're told is oftentimes to incite a response in all of us, to control our thoughts, to control our actions. If we look at the reality of the Arthurian legend of Gawain and the Green Knight, we see that there is a power in recognizing the flaws within ourselves. Because if we're able to recognize our own flaws, if we're able to perceive them, it's through that means that we're able to avoid the repeated mistakes that we've had in the past. It's by that awareness that we're able to achieve something so much more. We're able to achieve a unification within our society and our civilization. An understanding for all the differences that make us unique and make us special at the same time. This is considered a grave threat to the current powers that be. And we'll see that in our current civilization that every theme behind it is to prevent this from happening. To prevent us from understanding each other. You can even see it in the legend of the Tower of Babel. With the fact that a unified humanity was perceived to be a great threat. But we're never told why it was perceived to be a great threat. We're simply told that people being able to accomplish anything and having no limits on their achievements is a threat and it must be stopped. Therefore, go down and confuse their languages. Confuse. Is it really a concept though, a literal translation of speaking different languages? Or is it simply a matter of losing understanding? It's always interesting to me how we criticize and castigate relentlessly each other, those of us who don't feel the same way or those of us who don't think the same way. And yet oftentimes these are for the most bare bones and superficial differences that don't matter five minutes after a conversation is completed. We see the remnants though of the Arthurian legend spread out across the lands of what is now the United Kingdom. Even Arthur's Rock in Edinburgh, Scotland you can still see the beautiful remnants of what may have been the glories of the past. Consider the possibility that Arthur was a real figure, not someone who fought wars of unification in the United Kingdom, but perhaps a great leader of the previous Tartarian civilization. Someone who rose and held the people that they had under their charge to a higher standard and challenged them to look within and be aware of the flaws that they had as individuals, and as a result, achieve that balance that they once had between the individual and society, and also in integrating the artificial concepts of their society with nature. 
This is why you see a much more defined and inspiring building style in the past. These were the great achievements of the eras that came before us. And these are the achievements which many view as very threatening. And it seems as though there are many powers that work to prevent us from even perceiving this or questioning what they tell us is our given historical account. Then there's also the legend of Prester John, another myth that will be told. And yet, is this a myth that's based on religion? Or was Prester John the true leader of a surviving enclave of civilization from the Third Era that survived into the Fourth Era? I think that's the grave difference, though, between going from the Third Era or the Starfort Builders to the Fourth Era. And then it becomes another matter of add text. We have no story. We have no history. Therefore, whatever history we have is that which is given to us. And why would someone do this? It's a very simple explanation. Because if you can tell people exactly what to think, if you can tell them exactly what happened in the past, such as in this case where the Tartarian Empire has become an official conspiracy theory, according to Wikipedia. And we remember on this channel we talked about Brian Dunning. He's the primary wiki reference. We featured him in the previous video considering the mud flood on this channel. Hello, my name is Brian Hello, Dunning. My name is Brian I Dunning. Was born, I was born in Southern California in 1965. In August 2008, eBay filed suit against Dunning, accusing him of defrauding eBay and eBay affiliates. Dunning was sentenced in August 2014 to 15 months in prison, a result of his company receiving between $200,000 and $400,000 in fraudulent commissions from eBay. Dunning stated that he is innocent. He only agreed to the settlement because he could not afford to continue the legal battle. Source for this is Wikipedia. So this is our primary source, Brian Dunning. It seems as though he's implying that justice in the United States is based on monetary value, that you need money to have a favorable result. Why, that sounds like a conspiracy theory. And if Brian Dunning is really a conspiracy theorist, and how he considers the fact that Tartari is a conspiracy theory, there's only one way to deal with him. And we know how they prefer to deal with him. If there's any more shooting, Dr. Sayers, you'll be the first to go. The purpose of this exploration has been to consider how Tartaria rose from the ashes of the Third Era. Why is Tartaria and the concept of it important to us today? We'll be derided for saying that things were better in the past. But this isn't about wanting things to be better in the past. This is about understanding it so we can have a better future. And whatever you believe that better future is, it's important to have awareness. And it's important to recognize that we are individuals with flaws. We'll be told that the only reason our current civilization can't replicate the buildings of the past is simply a matter of money and effort. And there'll even be some that say that we can replicate it. However, the only thing they can do is replicate the buildings from the previous era. When you look at the great layouts of the star forts of the past, the way they integrated the artificial with the natural, you know this is something we cannot replicate today. And yet the evidence still exists out there. We will continue with the explorations of Tartar. We've explored many aspects of Tartaria on this channel before. We've also done theory videos where we've looked at what Tartaria looked like prior to the last reset. This channel calls Tartaria as our fourth era, or the civilization that preceded our current civilization. We believe it reached great heights. Heights that we can't even begin to imagine with incredible airships and spectacular architecture and technology. And yet we can still see that Tartaria fell. What was the reason it fell? What were some of the challenges that it faced? We've posited a potential timeline for Tartaria, and we believe that there was a great conflict that occurred during its second phase of its civilization, or the Ascendancy period, when Tartaria reached the very height of its civilization. What was really the nature of this conflict, and what gave us an indication that there was a great conflict that occurred? And how do we know that Tartaria prevailed in this conflict? This is a theory video, but I think it's an important theory video because we do have many signs around the lands and our remaining architectures and we'll be examining our great monuments and the symbolism behind those monuments that indicate to us that there was a great conflict that occurred during the ascendancy phase of Tartaria. 
we still see the remnants everywhere we look of the architecture of this civilization that preceded ours. We'll be assured by our mainstream that this wondrous architecture was merely the results of hard work and the earlier phase of our own civilization. And yet there are so many signs in it that we just don't fully recognize. There are so many things that just don't seem to make sense or match what we're told their origin tends to be. For example, the great fortresses all across the lands that were told were built during medieval times or even earlier. Yet by people who didn't possess the wonders and the benefits of the so-called industrial revolution. People who lacked logistical capacity. And yet there seemed to be no limits behind what they could achieve if they simply focused their minds on it. At the same time, we're also going to consider the fact that many of these structures are without a doubt the remnants of the Tartarian civilization that preceded ours. The signs are in their architectural capacity, their remote location, and the fact that many of these structures simply cannot be explained, not even by our current methods, in the modern era after the Industrial Revolution. These are structures that were completed by a civilization that not only possessed a wondrous technological know-how, building capacity and architecture that we can only begin to imagine, but they also had an incredible civilization and a society. In today's video, we're going to be exploring one of the greatest challenges that that society faced, and the unified civilization of humanity in the past era managed to overcome. We're also going to speculate in terms of who the adversary was that they actually faced. And while we've explored that on the channel before, today's exploration is going to look a little deeper and try to posit some more theories on that aspect as we look at the Great Conflict and Tartaria's Triumph. This is the monument to the Battle of the Nations. We're told it was built in Leipzig, Germany from 1898 to 1913. It's to commemorate the great victory over Napoleon, who we explored earlier this week. The attention we have towards this monument, though, is if we examine it in close detail, we see that there are many aspects of it that defy the explanation that this is truly a monument that is built to commemorate the Napoleonic conflict, or the Battle of the Nations that occurred towards the end of it. We see that there are many fine details with the figures on this monument, that don't seem to match what we would expect soldiers to be wearing during the Napoleonic conflict. Indeed, we see figures wearing suits of armor, carrying swords, in direct contravention to what we're told the primary weapon being used during the Napoleonic conflict was. Now, of course, we'll be told that this is merely an idyllic representation, that this is to inspire us in the monument, to show us true commemoration of the soldiers that served during the Napoleonic conflict. Yet we have armored knights and we have what appear to be lions. We do have some construction photos of this monument to the Battle of the Nations. Yet at the same time, we have the usual challenges that we do when we examine these construction photos. Does scaffolding really prove construction? Does a big hole in the ground in some non-discreet location really show construction? There's also an odd issue in with scaling. This monument is nearly 300 feet high, and the stones and the masonry used in it appear to be far older than what we're told. We see figures that do not match anything from the Napoleonic Wars, and we see a structure that seems to commemorate something else. Is this supposed to be some sort of monument that was built during the medieval period? Because these figures that we see depicted on this monument look as though they would reflect some great medieval battle. Perhaps the Duke of Austria or the King of the Holy Roman Empire. Yes, I know it was an emperor, but I'm just merely making fun at all the inconsistencies within the monument. It's a very impressive monument, and you see that the construction behind it is truly extraordinary. Not something we'd expect to have happen from 1898 to 1913. Completed just in time before the First World War. A monument to potentially an earlier world war. Or was this really a monument to any world war that our civilization knows of? What if this was truly a monument that was actually established by the civilization that preceded ours? The Tartarian civilization. Now I know to new viewers of the channel what I'm suggesting might be absurd and it might be offensive. But when we have observations of many of the figures that we see in this monument that just don't seem to make any kind of sense, 
what exactly is this figure here supposed to be representing from the Napoleonic conflict? This is not anything we have any account of. And even looking inside the monument, aside from truly impressive architecture, we see figures and representations that make absolutely no sense. They do not represent directly what we visualize as the soldiers that took part in the Napoleonic conflict. Where is the very well-dressed Duke of Wellington? Where is Admiral Nelson? Where is Prussian Field Marshal Blücher? This doesn't look anything like Field Marshal Blücher, or Wellington, or anyone else who participated in the Napoleonic conflict. So ask yourselves, what's really being depicted here? Is this just supposed to be some ideal representation of what transpired in the Napoleonic conflict? Or are these figures representing something completely different? Are they representing another civilization celebrating a great victory and triumph? When you examine these figures closely, and you consider what they may be representing, the symbolism behind them, you realize that there is a very strong possibility that they are depicting something from that Tartarian civilization that preceded ours. A civilization that valued life, that valued a unified societal effort and a great struggle that they faced. Who exactly was the adversary, though? And why do we believe that this monument to the Battle of the Nations really reflects them? Well, when it comes down to it, you analyze all these figures, and it's very difficult to find any sort of symbolism that matches that particular time frame. Now, of course, the official explanation will tell us that these figures merely represented the ideal times of German artwork from the late 19th and early 20th century, and it makes perfect sense. And of course, since people worked harder and there was no other needs going on in the German Empire at that time prior to World War I or their great effort towards colonialism, that they could afford to build a monument like this and do it quite easily. And these figures are merely representations of all the soldiers that served in the Napoleonic conflict. You don't need to build an exact representation, much like in the U.S. Civil War monuments, of which there are so many ubiquitous Civil War monuments that you can find in every courthouse in the United States. They always seem to be a column, and they always seem to have some sort of figure that is attached to the top. It's rather odd, though, because it seems as though that the Civil War monuments feel as though the actual base was already established, and then there were add-ons or modifications. Now, in some monuments, this shows a little bit more than others. These monuments are always called the Soldiers and Sailors Monuments, and you can find them across the land. The most prominent one that we looked at in previous explorations on this channel being the Soldiers and Sailors Monument in Indianapolis, Indiana. A very impressive and tall column adorned with numerous decorations. Now, to be fair and objective, some of the decorations towards the base do appear as Union soldiers. They do reflect what we'd expect to see from the nature of the Civil War. But the larger figures and the base stones don't seem to reflect that. And the figure on top of this very impressive monument most certainly does not seem to reflect anything from the Civil War. And we look at its very questionable construction and the so-called documentation of it. And there seems to be so many difficulties in simply explaining it. We also have accounts of other Civil War monuments that due to the how shall we say, changing perceptions of the time, have been modified by having the statues removed from them, as we can see in this impressive column of what used to be a Confederate monument. Yet if you just pull off the statue, what do you have? You still have the baseline column. Was there something else that was once on top of this column? Notice that they're also using a high-powered modern crane. There are many Civil War monuments across our favorite state to explore Iowa. And the reason we say Iowa is our favorite state to explore is because that's where all the exploration started. And naturally, they have a very impressive Soldiers and Sailors monument out in front of the Iowa State Capitol as well, almost looking like you're in Rome. The Soldiers and Sailors monument in Iowa we've looked at in a very early exploration on the channel. Now, this is certainly one that is very difficult to explain because we have this statue of Iowa. This was made in the 1890s. How exactly, given what we know of the society in the 1890s, would this have been appropriate or tolerated at that time? At that time, we're told that it was very inappropriate for a lady to show even her ankle. 
and yet here we have full frontal nudity being depicted. Other aspects of this monument don't really make a lot of sense, such as this figure we have that looks like Julius Caesar on the back. Now we do have Civil War soldiers and some strange portraits that are put on it, but I'm not beginning to question if this monument was modified that they had the statues that didn't make any sense and then changed them. And this other monument that's supposedly to a leading political figure in Iowa earlier in its history. And how exactly do any of the figures on this part of the monument make sense? There's also the Sergeant Floyd Monument, yet another obelisk that's located in Council Bluffs, Iowa. This is supposed to be dedicated to a fallen member of the Lewis and Clark expedition. So let me get this straight. A non-commissioned officer in the United States who died in the early, early 19th century has a very large obelisk dedicated to them as a monument and a memorial. Is that really what this is all about? Now, I know there's many different theories behind what obelisks could really represent and the power structure that they may represent. But for this exploration, let's just look at the fact and consider that the obelisk really is a monument. Here we actually have a... U.S. Army Corps of Engineers officer with facial hair, obviously before World War I. And yet we're told that the credit for this monument, that it was done in the early 1900s to commemorate Sergeant Floyd, who had fallen during the Lewis and Clark expedition. Now, granted, it's not an impressive obelisk that's the height of the Washington Monument that we looked at, but it's still impressive nonetheless. We also have other monuments that seem to indicate some sort of victory, and on many of the triumphal arches you see figures like this. But why are we always representing Rome? Well, if we look at our five eras theory that we go off of on the channel as the baseline of our explorations, we can see that the Tartarian era is the era that preceded ours, or the civilization that preceded ours. They had their own period of rise and ascendancy, and then eventually their fall. We also looked at the Reset War, which occurred after that civilization that preceded ours fell. And the Reset War was a conflict that was designed to destroy the remaining enclaves of the previous civilization. When we look at the Tartaria or Fourth Era Civilizations timeline, we see that it had three distinct phases, a rise, an ascendancy, and a decline. That decline came with a large battle that they had lost, or a significant conflict. We believe that that conflict was against the same adversary that they had faced earlier in their civilization and had defeated. In this exploration, we're looking and positing that all these monuments were in recognition of this adversary they defeated. And who was this adversary? Well, we've looked at it before when we did the exploration on ancient evil. We have serpents that are represented in many of these monuments we have serpents that are represented as a force of evil. And we certainly have the subculture of snakes or serpents representing evil. Now, do I want to be against snakes and say that you need to kill a snake if you come across it? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. We're merely considering the symbolism here. But we have symbolism from many different aspects that show that for whatever reason, the serpent represented the adversary that the previous civilization faced. Also, think on the nature that we're told of the serpent. The ability to deceive, the ability to change people from the inside and corrupt them. That seems to be what the serpent represented. So whoever this adversary was that Tartaria faced, they certainly had all kinds of unique abilities to change people from the inside out, and perhaps they even had the ability to change the shapes of their own physical forms. We just don't know. We still see aspects of the serpent that endure to this day in various belief systems across the land. We also look at how the representation of the serpent factors into many of our fantasy stories that we're told have no basis in fact and absolutely have no historical foundation. Yet we can't ignore the fact that the aspect of the serpent is constantly depicted and used in many different stories from Conan the Barbarian to the revived He-Man series, which, interestingly enough, was quickly canceled once they decided to depict a race of serpents that they fought, and even Snake Mountain becoming a giant serpent god. Now, that could all just be a coincidence, but I find it very fascinating that a popular cartoon that was used for marketing 
was suddenly no longer popular and pulled off the air very quickly. Again, it could just be a coincidence. There are depictions of serpents and what they represent in all cultures from all times from our contemporary era. We view the serpent with a sense of trepidation. And of course, there are many people who seem to have a natural, almost instinctive fear of serpents or snakes. Yet not all the time is the depiction or use of serpents negative. In the alternative, there seems to be a very positive depiction of serpents that can be seen with different societies, that they represented power and the ability to achieve power. However, looking at most of the representations, they seem to show a very powerful and capable adversary that had to be overcome. We look here at these reliefs in Riga and Latvia, and we see some very serpent-like qualities in this dragon creature. And indeed, dragons were also referred to as serpents or great worms. Many of these figures here in the same city showing what appears to be some sort of serpent adornment. Is it possible that these were compromised human beings from the previous civilization? Were they changed in some sort of fundamental way and this created a different segment within the previous Tartarian civilization that fought against it? Perhaps this was the enemy that they had to fight and overcome, and this was the great victory that they won. Until, as we suspect, the adversary changed their tactics and tended to be much more successful as they did so. It's hard to say, but at the same time, you can find this symbolism all over the land, from many different cultures, or at least so we're told. But do we really see these as different cultures? Or are all these symbols, or all these pictures, all these reliefs, very, very similar in how they're depicted. And what are the odds that all these symbols, all these reliefs, and all these depictions would look exactly the same across timelines and across many different civilizations? Because you can see that in many different civilizations they represented the serpent as some sort of divine being. Of course, the question always comes down to was this a positive or a negative depiction? And to be frank, you can see both. The reliefs in Riga also show something else, a power of a lion, the power of the sun. There are many different symbols, and we will be exploring Riga in due time. It's quite an interesting location. But for right now, we're just taking a look at what we see. And in the symbols, it's almost as though we see a little bit of a conflict being represented. A conflict of almost two segments of humanity or perhaps an uncorrupted segment of humanity against a corrupted segment of humanity. It's really hard to say. Yet, we see some of the familiar symbols that we've seen in other explorations that we've done. We always see the lion, and the lion's always in a position of power. We've also seen this helmet before, and this helmeted figure. And it's in the most unlikely of places on a building that we're told was Art Deco in New York State. And yet, even more interesting figures that could perhaps depict something that was far more advanced. Is this a bean? Is this just an artistic representation? What exactly is this relief truly of? There's no shortage that we have, though, of triumph figures, or figures that are depicted on arches of triumph. And usually you'll have the same consistent images or statues. We have a horse we have what typically tends to be a woman wearing a wreath or a laurel around the head. Sometimes we even have angelic wings. What exactly is this supposed to represent? And why exactly do we see this symbol depicted so frequently everywhere that we look? We're always told that the laurel wreath was usually the Roman symbol of victory and oftentimes worn during the so-called Roman triumph. But did the Romans really exist as we think or believe them to have existed? And yet, looking in other forms of symbolism that we have across the land, we can still see the power that was depicted in both eagles and lions. And interestingly enough, we're told that the so-called Roman civilization venerated the eagle, the aquila as they called it, that their legions carried. But what if this was merely a subversion of what really happened? What if the previous civilization did use eagles and lions, in addition to the often seen griffin, to represent an animal of power, to represent their unified strength when they engage this terrifying adversary? We even have depictions such as Perseus 
decapitating Medusa and holding the head up high, and this was most certainly not an easy task. We have numerous depictions of lions and eagles fighting and defeating snakes, and in nearly every depiction that you see, it is the lion or the eagle that is victorious. That with the full power of the previous civilization, the adversary stood no chance against it. But we believe that the adversary changed their tactics and subverted the previous civilization, suddenly making the people believe that their great heroes were actually villains and they began to decay and destroy themselves from the inside out. It might seem like it's not a plausible explanation, yet at the same time, we can see that in our current civilization, division and strife are the very things that seem to be constantly reinforced in every segment of our current society. But looking at all the depictions, we can see that there was a civilization there was a time where they seemed to be far more unified in purpose. And it was through that unification and purpose that we see in all this symbolism that they were able to achieve a great victory over the adversary that they had faced in the fourth era. Other aspects that you consider when you look at many of these reliefs and many of what is represented in these statues is to realize that this was not an easy battle. Oftentimes we see that this was a life or death struggle, and perhaps this represented what the previous civilization truly faced. Now it's true, these monuments, these statues, these paintings, all these depictions could simply be a coincidence, a coincidence that all these symbols represent different things from different cultures across different times. And once again you have to ask the question just how many coincidences are we actually looking at and accepting for the account that we have of history to be exactly accurate and correct? How difficult was this struggle the previous civilization faced? And if it really was the great triumph that we see, and we see many triumph arches all across the land, the arches of triumph showing the wondrous architectural capabilities while at the same time reflecting reflecting the achievements of that previous civilization. Now, could these remaining monuments have been altered over time with all the so-called renovations that we witness? That the symbols, at least some of the symbols that could be changed, were changed to potentially give us a different perception or to try to reflect to us that there were many different civilizations that just happened to have a appreciation for one root previous civilization. I find that explanation very difficult to believe. I find it very difficult to believe in the fact that everybody wanted to emulate the great architectural achievements of Rome and Greece, and they kept doing it all the way to the end of the 1800s? How exactly does that make any sense? Or does it make more sense that all of these stunning monuments and architectural achievements that we see, all of these symbols, the reason there is so much recursion in them is because they were produced by that civilization that preceded ours. That the civilization had their monuments and they produced their monuments to reflect their great achievement of winning a very difficult conflict. A conflict that required their society to truly be unified. You have to ask yourself these questions. What truly makes sense? And if it doesn't make sense, how exactly do you explain it? You always ask the five W's. The who, what, where, when, and why. And after you ask those five W's, then you have to ask, how? And if it's not easy to answer those questions, and if you notice inconsistencies, then you have to ask more questions, and you have to keep exploring. Because the answer tends to elude us if we just accept whatever simple explanation that we're given, even if it makes no sense whatsoever. Such as this wonderful monument being constructed in 24 minutes, which someone may try to tell us. And do we believe it? Or do we question it? It's ultimately up to us how far we want to go with these explorations. And if we're really seeking answers. It's not easy. It's certain to say that the path of least resistance is just to accept exactly what you've been told. To accept that there are legitimate reasons for all of these monuments looking the same. For all this architecture appearing the same. Even though in some cases between the cultures that constructed them there's a thousand years and what we're told is half a world 
away of distance. So how exactly does that make any sense when you really consider it? I believe that these monuments that we're looking at, the reason that they're so similar is that they did become, or they did come from the civilization that preceded ours. As a little bit of a bonus, I wanted to take a closer look at the Cathedral Basilica in St. Louis, Missouri. When we explored the basilica on the ground, I didn't really have the chance to stay inside and really look at all the symbolism that we had within the very impressive cathedral. We can see here at the altar, we have what looks to be a smaller dome. Now remember the size and immensity of this building. I also wanted to take a close look at the mosaics or the paintings, because what do they really represent? We're told that this is a very impressive Catholic cathedral basilica in St. Louis. Are these figures supposed to be the wise men, the apostles? There's many unique paintings and drawings and figures that adorn the domes, the walls, the arches, all the impressive structural achievements of this unbelievable edifice. Here looking up in the dome we see what appears to be angelic figures. We also have what we would expect to be the representation of Jesus and yet at the same time we see other figures on the inside of the dome and under the dome. What exactly is this supposed to represent? Some aspect of the Holy Spirit within the individual? The more you look, it seems as though you get more questions, because these are very interesting depictions. Is this something from Ben-Hur, even though this cathedral basilica was constructed well before that film came out? At least so we're told, although I suspect it was constructed very long before Ben-Hur ever came out. Looking here over at uh, this particular dome, they seem to represent more modern aspects within this painting. Yet, we see many structures that are depicted on the wall as well. Is that showing some sort of development? Or is that chronicling something that came in a civilization before us? Because you look and you see some of the structures that are depicted in the painting. And what exactly do these symbols represent? And I'm sure there'll be many who will tell me that these are simple Catholic representations and that they represent the ultimate form of piety in Catholicism. And that's fine, and I could accept that. But I have to look at these figures, I have to look at these depictions, and really ask what exactly is being depicted. Is this really showing us what we're told? Well, here it may. And I do suspect that there are tenets of our major religions in our current civilization that do have their origin in our very distant past. So, could we have constructed parts of it, changed it, decorated it? Yes. But are there portions of it that have been there a very long time? Will pour out my spirit on all flesh. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. What exactly is this representing? And what does it truly mean? Both the saying and the depiction. Now I have some familiarity with Catholicism, but that just defies what I'm aware of. Maybe somebody out there can help me in the comments. Yeah. <laughs>